The end of the world as we know it not only saw the destruction of infrastructure and death of hundreds of thousands, but also the collapse of many systems that make up society. Major pillars like government, media, and education collapsed, leaving nothing but ruin. Through the ashes though, at least one important aspect of society remained. Trade would become crucial for the survival of all post-war inhabitants. This is ordinary but valuable. Today we'll be examining an item that was once considered trash, but now, after nuclear hellfire has run its course, is a vital part of any trade deal. The bottle cap is ordinary but valuable. The idea of trade has been around since humans first learned how to communicate with one another in prehistoric times. After all, one person can't do everything themselves, so people traded goods and services for other goods and services. If you had a pelt, you could trade that for a new spearhead, that sort of thing. The price of these things was determined and agreed upon by both parties before an exchange took place. Since, the concept of trading has evolved with the traditional economy going from gift-based to currency-driven. Instead of an exchange of goods and services, we now use a generally accepted commodity, or money, to facilitate trades. But why? Why go from an exchange of goods and services to one that uses a currency? And the answer is convenience. Let's say someone wanted to trade for a necklace, and the jeweler who made the necklace wants a carton of eggs in exchange. What happens if the person wanting the necklace doesn't have a carton of eggs? What now? Now you have to get a carton of eggs from the chicken farmer in order to get the necklace. Well, currency fixes that problem. Now values are assigned to items using a standard unit. Dollars, pounds, rupees, etc. It makes for trading things that a customer wants a whole lot easier, and ensures that both the customer and vendor get what they want. Once upon a time, the American dollar was backed by gold. This meant that the amount of dollars in circulation was directly tied to the amount of gold in the nation's gold reserves. A dollar amount could be exchanged for an equivalent amount of gold. In simple terms, the dollar was really just an IOU. I give you this dollar and you can trade it for other goods or you can get your value back in gold. In theory, a currency could be backed by anything really. But the caveat is that a group of people, a population, need to agree that that thing has value. It kind of goes back to the gift-based economy. An exchange of goods using money only works if both parties agree that that money has value. For example, it's likely that you wouldn't be able to buy something in the States with money from Australia because outside of a currency exchange, the Aussie dollar isn't perceived as having value in the States. It has no purchasing power. And I know it sounds a bit silly to try and explain money and the importance of money, but these fundamental concepts will hopefully provide some context as to why the bottle cap specifically was accepted as the dominant wasteland currency. The first documented use of the bottle cap as a currency on the west coast came about with the creation of its largest trading hub, the hub. According to the Fallout Bible, it was in 2093, 16 years after the Great War, that a man named Angus set up his camp around a filthy oasis and old town. The burger man would begin trading with the early post-war settlements. Over time, other traders and merchants joined Angus's camp and began trading their wares to nearby settlements as well. It wouldn't be long before Angus's humble camp would turn itself into California's greatest trading center, cheekily dubbed the Hub. In order to solve disputes between the competing merchants, the hub's central council was founded. Two representatives from each major merchant house, the Crimson Caravan, Fargo Traders, and the Water Merchants, would maintain order and mediate conflict. Due to the hub's prominence within the wasteland, it was the great merchant houses there who controlled, protected, and regulated trade. More specifically, it was the water merchants who staked a claim to the town's water tower that were seemingly the most powerful. The water merchants, by controlling the water tower, controlled all fresh water distribution to the immediate surrounding area. If you wanted clean drinking water, you'd have to buy it directly from the water merchants or from a trader who was reselling it after having bought it from the water merchants originally. It really makes you wonder what the resale value on water is, huh? Through being this influential, the water merchants, using their stores of water, were able to back a new form of currency. We learn from Katrina, the Shady Sands town greeter in the first fallout, 
that bottle caps are the only common money found in the wasteland. She explains that the bottle caps are backed by merchants of the hub, so that they can be traded anywhere. Joshua Sawyer further elaborated on a something awful forum that a certain number of caps can be exchanged for a standard measure of water. As a rare and precious resource, the merchant's clean water would back the use of bottle caps in trade. No longer did wastelanders need to trade goods for other goods. Goods and services on the west coast could now be purchased using Nuka-Cola bottle caps. On the other side of the country, the east coast wastelanders coincidentally began using the bottle cap due to different circumstances entirely. I'll warn you now, the tale of how the east coast adopted the bottle cap is a longer one. It's not nearly as simple as we found this clean water tower, so now you can use caps to buy things. It's a bit more, um, involved, so to say. The White Spring used to be a premier destination resort for America's elite. Once touting luxurious rooms, high-end shops and boutiques, and a celebrated golf course, the White Spring stopped being profitable around 2065. A change was needed. The 2080 initiative would be that change. Announced in 2075, the 2080 initiative would see a full-scale retrofit of the resort. To pay for these improvements, White Spring management began selling off its surrounding land. The initiative would bring a new life to the 200-year-old attraction. The golf course would be improved for a new era of sport. Guest rooms, suites, and cottages would be refurbished through their modern heritage program. And a high-end revamp would hopefully give businesses and corporations a reason to rent out their corporate facilities. The cherry on top? A fully automated workforce to adhere to the whims of the guests. Unfortunately though, one by one, these new initiatives would face a litany of problems or fail completely. The once championship golf course became an over budget, incomplete disappointment. The refurbs on the new guest rooms took forever to secure funding. Big corporations like General Atomics, Robco Industries, and Hubris Comics all cancelled their planned corporate events. And the implementation of the near fully robotic staff meant that most human employees were now effectively fired, leading to a massive PR nightmare. The only real success the 2080 initiative managed to secure, one with minimal problems, was a corporate sponsorship with Nuka-Cola. As part of their Nuka-Cola quantum marketing campaign, the resort would have to accept a new type of currency. Resort guests would be able to make purchases using Nuka-Cola bottle caps. While the promotion, even to the staff, was quite bonkers, White Spring management needed a win. And so, starting in October 2077, all shops within the White Spring would accept bottle caps as legal tender. This pre-war promotion would end up shaping the East Coast wasteland. 23 days after the start of the promotion, global nuclear conflict would see the destruction of America and much of the world. As Appalachia was not a high priority target for nukes, and the White Spring was a massive, well-stocked luxury resort, it made for the perfect place to seek shelter. This was a boon for the four human staff members, 92 guests, and 500 robots that survived the Great War within the White Spring. The White Spring was stock full of food, water, clothes, meds, spare parts, generators, guns, and ammo. The survivors would be well supplied for at least a decade. The only caveat was that many of these supplies were purchased as products to be sold within the White Spring's many shops. Taking them would be considered stealing by the resort's security robots. So, the survivors would collect as many bottle caps as they could from around the White Spring and use them as makeshift ration stamps, evenly distributing them amongst themselves. I'd figure that this was the first instance of a bottle cap being used as currency post-war. With their survival needs covered, the White Spring survivors were in a great spot. Well, it was great until the modern heritage remodeling project, led by the undeterred robots, was set to start in January 2079. Restricted by their programming, the robots threatened to evict the human survivors by force if they did not leave the premises by the start of the new year. Unable to do anything to stop the robots, the survivors set out into the wasteland for the first time. The White Spring, now occupied solely by robots, would remain on lockdown for years, patiently waiting for a building inspector to give the A-OK -okay for the resort to reopen. 
It would be on May 30th, 2086, nine years after the Great War and seven years after the eviction of the survivors, that a mysterious person only known by their initials, OR, would disable the lockdown, opening its facilities and grounds for all wastelanders. With the robot staff still operating the shops, and still accepting bottle caps as legal tender, they would unknowingly start and regulate bottle caps as a currency within Appalachia. Over time, the influence of the bottle caps as a currency and trade unit only grew. Traders and merchants would accept bottle caps, knowing that they could be cashed in at the White Spring for other goods. This influence would seemingly reach other eastern post-war regions like the Capital Wasteland, the Commonwealth, the Pit, Point Lookout, and more. Backed by the pre-war Nuka-Cola Quantum promotion, the bottle cap became a staple of East Coast trade. The West Coast cap is backed by the hub's water merchants, and the East Coast cap is backed by the vendors at the White Spring Resort. But why? Why exactly the bottle cap? What is so special about these, typically Nuka-Cola, bottle caps that stops another currency from taking over? Well, it's due to a few factors. The first is their limited nature. As with many other companies in America, Nuka-Cola Corp ceased operations post-war. Who knew it was so hard to keep a business going when your facilities, employees, vendors, and other supporting infrastructure go up in flames? This meant that there was only ever a limited amount in circulation. There's no worry of a flood of caps appearing out of nowhere to devalue the currency. And the second is their difficulty to reproduce. Even if someone wanted to try and devalue the cap by making their own, it would be extremely difficult. The Nuka-Cola caps were originally manufactured using a unique machine press, paint, and type of metal. This combination made it so that post-war, it was quite difficult to genuinely reproduce them. Sure, some counterfeit caps could be produced, but according to Alice McLafferty, it was always small scale. This was likely due to the time-consuming nature of getting all 21 crimps and ridges correct, the label perfectly stylized, and crafting the cap in the proper proportions. Though infrequently, word of a recently discovered bottle cap press can cause some concern for the merchant house's precious trade unit. So these merchants make it a point to scour for old bottle cap presses in order to recover them or disable them. But the production of new bottle caps isn't always malicious. Sometimes the merchant houses need new bottle caps to be in circulation, whether it be because an old cap has been worn down or it was blown up through their use in improvised explosives. Sometimes new caps are needed. And so these presses are recovered and kept secure. The rarity of the bottle cap and difficulty to effectively reproduce is the reason why the bottle cap was chosen. And due to their prominence in the wasteland even 200 years after their respective adoptions on either coast, it turned out to be a good choice for a currency. Despite the widespread benefits of using the bottle cap, that didn't stop other organizations or regions from attempting to adopt and mint their own currency. Following its official founding in 2189, the New California Republic wanted an official currency that they themselves could regulate. Coincidentally, their resource of choice was the same one from pre-war, gold. The NCR would mint gold coins from their vast gold reserves. This gold-backed dollar worked well for a time. By 2241, the NCR dollar had rendered the bottle cap useless in regions under NCR influence, the NCR, Vault City, and New Reno. However, during their conflict with the Brotherhood of Steel, the NCR's gold reserves were plundered to the point that the ambitious nation had to stop minting new coins entirely. Instead, paper money was printed. This turned their gold-backed dollar into a fiat currency, one that is not backed by anything. It cannot be exchanged for anything, and its value comes solely from the government and population agreeing that it has value. This is how most currencies are today. Anyway, with the NCR dollar now a fiat currency, its value plummeted. The dollar was once worth its weight in gold. Now, it was only worth the government's word. This made trading with the dollar in the NCR's fringes quite difficult. It wouldn't be long before the hub merchants conspired to bring back the water-backed bottle cap. Further east from the NCR, another nation, although more tribal, had their own mineral-backed coinage. 
Kaisar's Legion currency was a silver-backed and gold-backed coin commonly used within Legion territory and among traders in the frontier regions. While Kaisar and his Legion are not particularly well celebrated, their coin holds more value than the rival NCR dollar thanks to the precious minerals that make up the coin. Unlike the NCR, if the Legion were to dissolve tomorrow, at least their coins could be melted down into valuable silver and gold. Outside of the NCR dollar and Legion money, other currencies have tried to find a place within the wasteland. Gold bullion still remains as a precious resource to those interested. Mine scripts within Reading supplement the NCR dollar. The Chicago Brotherhood chapter has their own type of script, and the people of Chicago settled on using ring pulls instead of caps. Even still, despite the introduction of many new currencies in the American wasteland, the bottle cap still reigns supreme. Clean water on the west coast would prove too valuable, and the already established cap economy at the White Spring was literally hardwired into the robot vendors. And that is the tale of the bottle cap. A once ordinary and worthless bottle topper was turned into the key component of trades among all wastelanders. One world's trash is another world's treasure. Thanks for listening. That's all from me today, folks. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. People have been counterfeiting bottle caps forever, but it's always been small scale. A bottle cap press is a whole other threat. We can't have anyone devaluing our currency by mass producing new bottle caps.